Hello and welcome back. And that's right, today I want to talk about this. This is the Fizon E31T DRAMless SSD controller for Gen 5. That's right, Gen 5 DRAMless controllers are out there. And I know that half the audience have gone, what? Who, who cares? What? And I, I totally get you. I completely understand. Understanding the kind of need for something like this and the appeal to some users for a DRAMless SSD like this one is hard to understand. In the last couple of years, we have spent a lot of time talking about high performance SSDs. And ever since Gen 5 SSDs arrived in the market, I think it would be fair to say that most users have not really got it. It's either that the fact that they're too expensive or the simple fact that even if you are able to have a system that can fully saturate a drive like this you just can't do it for very long and gen 5 suffers over saturation very very quickly and when you do have ram on board the drive gets or the dram it gets completely oversaturated and that promised 12 13 14 gigabytes per second performance absolutely nosedives Realistically, although Gen 5 CPUs in both mobile SoC and desktop scale are now becoming more affordable and available, Gen 5 SSDs are still something of an anathema. But with the prices coming down and more of those mobile CPUs in the 13th and 14th Gen from Intel and the like rolling out in laptop and desktop you know, compact PC form, drives like this are starting to become appealing. Now, for those unaware, quick, you know, update, uh, or a little school here. SSDs generally arrive with three main components on board. There are other ones, little transistors and stuff, and we'll talk about that another time. But the main ones are the controller, which serves as the brain or the CPU, if you want to go for the painful simile. They arrive with the storage, which in this case are blocks of NAND. That's where your data lives. And finally, they traditionally have an area of memory. Again, simile computer, much the same. However, DRAMless SSDs do not have that. They remove it and therefore lower the cost of production. They free up a lot more real estate for those NAND chips all the way around for distribution. And they rely on the host system to take uh, to allow some of its available memory to bolster the drive's utilization in the exchanges and the indexing and the table of data going back and forth. Host memory buffer. And it's pretty well supported there. So a drive like this is going to be great for several different deployments. For example, if you're going to be utilizing Gen 5 SSD, SSD speeds on a really compact mini PC, like many of the ones we talked about, maybe on an Ultrabook or a very, very thin laptop, some of which, by the way, are at times two speed, but they're still using Gen 5 lane CPUs. Having a, uh, a drive like this one is going to allow you to hit some of those larger speeds a great deal more easily, but with a lower impact. But we've got to talk about temps, because although this lacks the flash, the kind of memory there on board, that controller, the Fizon E31T that we've been talking about for the better part of a year and a half, I might add, it gets hot. And running this drive without any kind of active cooling on it, I would argue is as bad, if not worse, than any other SSD that I've utilized with DRAM on board. To put it into perspective, and we'll go through the results a little bit more later on, this drive that was sent to me by Fizon, by the way, in this lovely packaging, even when I was doing nothing with it, was hitting temperatures of 50 degrees. During peak utilization with a heat sink on board and in the open, I actually used a test rig with no casing, so it had nothing but active airflow, was still hitting 68 degrees with an active cooling fan on board and open air surrounding it. This drive still got pretty warm. Now, 68 is not throttle territory. It's not gonna burn the drive out. But it's still weirdly high when I'm using the drive with active cooling and out in the open. Imagine what this will be like in a more compact space. Now, to their credit, Fizon create the controller. Everyone else creates the NAND. This drive, for example, arrived in 2TB with two blocks of 218 layer 3D TLC NAND on board. One cell of 1TB each with nothing on the back there. But when brands like team group, when greens like Patriot, when many and many of the bigger players in the SSD market start integrating the Fizon controller on board, then things will change. They will apply their own heat shields. They will apply their own heat sinks. They will change the NAND distribution, perhaps, to multiple 512 blocks all the way around. NANDs, it's okay if that gets warm. Ultimately, I'm not going to critique Fizon for the build of the NAND or the build of the drive. I will talk about the performance a little bit. And one of the things I really liked 
is the durability on this drive. It rocked out with a 600 and 1200, 1TB and 2TB respectively, terabytes written. That equates to a 0.38 drive writes per day rating, which is damn good for a DRAMless drive. And that controller makes up two A5 Cortex cores with inbuilt ECC correction throughout. So again, a very, very comprehensively well-made controller when they could have just bashed out a repro of their own existing DRAMless SSD controllers in the Gen 4, but they had to scale it up because of the larger bandwidth performance available to Gen 5 there, hence the slight delay, I'm sure. Now, it supports in when it's you know deployed to other vendors at the end of this year and in Q1 2025, it's going to support up to 8TB. Again, no doubt, thanks to the fact you're going to be able to get eight individual 1TB NAND uh, modules all the way wrapped around that 2280 PCB. And on to the subject of 2280, keep in mind that much like the Steam Deck and its support of Gen 4 architecture, allowing for great little 2232 and 22, I'm sorry, 2230 and 2242 length SSDs, which, you know, space is at a premium and therefore the lack of DRAM can be beneficial. Now the Gen 5 market is opening up to DRAMless SSDs, the next generation of those portable power consoles or handheld power consoles are definitely going to be benefiting from this. But just keep in mind, this drive is going to be way more about read than it is about write. Operating systems, tick. Static databases, tick. But large AI engines that are going to require a great deal of write as well as read, Slightly less so. When we went ahead with our performance testing, the numbers we were given by Files on War as follows. That this drive could hit 10 gigabytes per second in terms of read and between 8.8 .8 to 9 gigabytes per second write. Now, had I been using some highfalutin madness AMD system that they do highly recommend, generally you get better performance numbers from those, um, I probably could have hit those numbers. But I will say that even on my relatively domestic class uh, Intel i5 12 gen test machine that I was dismantling for another video about John spoke keep your eyes open for that I will say that this did damn well in crystal disk with a one gig test file it immediately hit over 10 gigabytes per second read performance then right performance at 8.8 .8, well within the remit of uh, what Fizon said a drive like this can do when we continued further, we moved on to AJA. We saw 9.5 over 7 gig and 9.7 over 8.9 gig read and write respectively. Very, very respectable numbers given that my system was running a comparatively Gen 5, of course, but still domestic class architecture. Now, Atto, which measures things ever so slightly different in terms of the calculation of gigabytes, did was seemingly a little lower, but it was still able to hit well into the 8 to 8.5 and even as high as 8.9 in some of my tests across 2.5 meg, 1 gig and 4 gig test files now. When we went to IOPS, however, IOPS is where my system flagged somewhat. In terms of read IOPS, it was absolutely fine here. 1.3 million and 1.4 million, both of which are articulated by Fizon of what this controller is capable of doing. But my right IOPS sat uncomfortably at around five to 600,000. Now, a lot of that was to do with my own PC architecture. And again, had I used a more highfalutin system, I'm pretty confident I still would have hit the million in terms of right IOPS there. But this system and the way this SSD is being built, I get the impression that those systems aren't the ones that this is targeted towards. Had you used this Gen 5 SSD in a highfalutin AMD system, then fine, you probably could have hit 1.3, 1.4, maybe 1.4 and a half million IOPS. But this is designed for more petite systems, more read prioritized systems. And in that world, this drive is going to be very hard to beat. And I keep saying this drive, I mean, of course, that controller. Now, before I close the video, I will also highlight that there are going to be some users that do highlight, I mentioned in my other videos, that not all systems have access to host memory buffer. Most of them do, but some of them don't. And also, some users actually don't like to use it because they're very lean in memory utilization and permissions. Now, I went ahead and installed this drive inside an Unraid setup. I used the same test rig, but booted off a USB stick with Unraid on board, found the drive, went into the PCIe architecture, I went in, found the lane distribution there and found the drive was definitely still utilizing a Gen 5 times 4 lane. I then went ahead and did repeated read and write tests at one gigabyte on this drive, but more importantly, without caching or HMB. And it was still able to hit 
5 to 5.6 and as low as 4.9 to 5, 5.1 gigabytes per second read and write across the board. I'm sure it's there on screen. I was really happy with that. Very few users are ever going to utilize this in a non-HMB setting, but it was still good to get those numbers, which are bordering on Gen 4 numbers out of this drive with caching disabled. And ultimately, it still shows that Fison have done an absolute banger of a job on this controller. Now, normally at this point in the video, I would point below and say there are links to buy this drive right now with those retailers. But there isn't, because right now we have yet to see this controller on a retail drive. Now that's not gonna take much longer. And I'm sure those drive and SSDs are gonna start rolling out at the end of the year or the start of the next. Do I like this? Yes. I think Fison made it very clear what their remit was on this drive and I think they've done a damn fine job with it. I will say temperature is still a concern on this. Like most Gen 5 drives, I would argue even more so on this. Let me remind you, I had this drive under a massive powered active heatsink and in open air it wasn't being kept inside a case it wasn't in some tightly packed laptop this thing i could see it i could touch it 68 degrees isn't low it's not the end of the world and it, again as mentioned it's not going to throttle but in a drive that was in active cooling and in open air that seemed weirdly high for me but as long as you're going to prioritize read in the future, in the next 12 to 18 months, as we see more and more drives rocking out with the E31T controller from Fison, I think these are going to do very well as an operating system drive. And chances are, you're never even going to know you've got this in your next Windows 11 laptop. But this has been my review of the Fison E31T SSD controller. Gen 5 DRAMless, what's not to love? Well, probably a few things. In the link below, you can find out our full written review over on NAS Compares. And as more SSDs start to arrive on the scene that support this architecture, I'll try and add them below and to that article. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.